Today I'm going to be talking about osmoregulation in the kidney and just the general movement of substrates in the nephron. So first of all, this is the structure of the kidney. So as you can see, there's the cortex, there's the medulla, and then the renal pelvis. So what we're going to talk about is the nephron, which is around here, like on the outer between the cortex and the medulla. And nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Okay, so if you look closely, this is a diagram from BioNinja. And as you can see again, it's going to be, you kind of want to see where the cortex is and the medulla is because the nephron is kind of in between those two parts. Okay, so I'll first focus on the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. So first of all, this is in the, this is the bloodstream and then we have all these stuff in the glomerulus and the glomerulus is the kind of like the bundle of blood veins so there's gonna be ultra filtration within within this glomerulus to the Bowman's capsule and so there's going to be porous capillaries and podocytes that's going to allow ultrafiltration for all of these substances to be absorbed. And all of them are going to be absorbed, including the urea. And the only things that are left in the glomerulus will be blood proteins such as red blood cells. And there's going to be selective absorption in the proximal convoluted tubule. So as these move down, the there will be selective absorption of, let's say, H2O. But H2O will be a passive transportation. And other things like NACA glucose, which is like a big molecule, will be active transport. And mineral and vitamins. And then moving to the loop of Henle. There is a loop of Henle, and this is going to be the descending limb and the uh, ascending limb. So, first of all, we know that the glucose and mineral ions are selectively absorbed to the medulla and the, I mean the cortex, and then the urea is in here, and then there's NaCl and H2O. However, the descending limb is permeable to water, so water will be again reabsorbed. And it's important to remember that when I say absorb, it's not saying absorbing to the tubule, but rather absorb to the body, which is to the medulla, which is, here is the medulla. And then as you move down to the ascending limb, there's still water left. But then in the ascending limb, there's only permeable to NaCl. So also there's its passive transport in the bottom part and its active transport. So NaCl will be absorbed. And also we can call this the counter current system, which is that there's a flow of fluid in opposite directions, as you can see, it goes down and up. And also, it's a countercurrent multiplier, which is saying that as you go steeper into, like deeper into the medulla, there is a steeper gradient of concentration of NaCl. So it will be like the highest concentration of NaCl here, and it will be less as you go up. And the vasa recta, which will be kind of like the bloodstream, which is not shown in this diagram, but around here. It will absorb the other stuff that, like water, into the body, yeah, to keep like the concentration level equal. So this is the overall, and now we're gonna focus on the collecting duct. So in the collecting duct, there is osmoregulation from, and the collecting duct flows from the medulla to the renal pelvis, and. And here we need to know the function of ADH. As Avril mentioned, ADH is a type of vasopressin, which kind of regulates the blood, I mean the water concentration in the body. And the high so first of all, the hypothalamus, which is in the brain, will detect like the water concentration in your body and whether one's dehydrated or not. And if one's dehydrated, then they'll be they'll send higher ADH from the pituitary. Gland, posterior pituitary gland and this is a negative feedback mechanism so if you have low water then there will be higher ADH and the ADH will make your collecting duct higher to permeability
And the way that I kind of memorize this is that ADH, it's really hard, so you're thinking if you have ADH, it's like adding H2O, add H2O. Right.